All right, let's start our lecture on mountain building. Mountain building has occurred recently in the recent geologic past. Some great examples are the American Cordillera, the Alpine Himalayan, Himalayan chain, and the uh, terrains of the Western Pacific. Okay, but there are also some very old mountains that have been around for a while or occurred a long time ago, like the uh, Paleozoic. Uh, the Appalachian Mountains are very old and the Urals in Russia. Um, and those mountains, they've been around for so long that they're deeply eroded. And in terms of their topology, uh, are, very, are less prominent. Okay, so here we can see uh, kind of the major mountain chains. The, the young mountain belts are in red. So we have the Andes, the Cordilleran Mountains, the Alps that bleed into the Himalayas, okay? And then any, anywhere in uh, kind of this bluish color uh, are the uh, older mountain chains. So we've got the Appalachians and the Caledonians, uh, actually related, and then so the Urals, okay, some examples. Orogenesis is the kind of collective term to describe all the things that occur uh, during the mountain building process, okay? So <clears throat> the faults that form, thrust faults, uh, transform faults, pull away stuff, accretion, accretion, terrain accretion, all, all those uh, processes that we'll talk about fall under the orogenesis uh, term, okay? Um, and essentially, uh, they show evidence of compressional forces, a convergent plate boundary where two tectonic plates are kind of colliding with one another, okay? And when this happens, a lot of metamorphic rocks will be created. There's some igneous activity, okay? There's a lot of geologic action occurring, okay? And the plate tectonics theory really provides the model to explain orogenesis, okay? And Many of the major mountain chains we find on Earth are the result of this plate tectonic convergence. All right, here's an example of Mount Kidd, some form, former uh, sedimentary rocks that were laid uh, down flatly at an ocean uh, margin with a continent. Uh, they underwent compression. Uh, a thrust fault formed and started to fold these once horizontal sedimentary rocks. All right, so here's an example of a low angle thrust fault. Okay, so let's talk about subduction zones. Subduction zones are a convergent uh, plate boundary. Okay, so there's compression, compressional forces dominate. Um, and mountains can be built in these types of environments. There are four major features of a subduction zone. We'll explore each one of these. There's the volcanic arc. Okay, that's where the uh, magma that's generated in this region makes it to the surface. There's the deep ocean trench where we have the subducting ocean plate. The four arc region is the area uh, in between the trench and the volcanic arc. And the back arc region is behind the volcanic arc. Okay, so volcanic arcs are essentially uh, kind of a, a, like a line of uh, active volcanoes or formerly active volcanoes that are there because of the partially melted uh, overlying mantle material that rises up uh, when those magmas are created. Okay, so melts that are generated because of the um, dewatering of the surface of the subducting slab um, lowers the melting, melting temperatures of the mantle wedge. Melts are generated, they migrate upwards through um, the overriding plate, which uh, can be ocean lithosphere or can be uh, continental crust. If those melts kind of move through overlying uh, oceanic lithosphere, then uh, the resultant volcanoes or what you would get are a, a volcanic island arc, okay? And if those melts migrate through continental crust, then you'll get continental arc volcanism. Okay, so here are the two examples. Here we have a subducting, subducting ocean lithosphere. The melts are generated here on the surface of that subducting lithosphere, lowering the asthenospheric mantle me melting temperatures. Melts are generated. Most of them, um, uh, most of the melts stagnate in the overlying lithosphere. Uh, 
and become bathless, but some do make it to the surface. They erupt. Uh, the surface manifestation of that are volcanoes. And in this case, because the overriding lithosphere here is oceanic, you get here is the volcanic arc region. Okay, so you have a, a, a line of uh, volcanoes here. Um, here's the trench. Okay, it's a deep part of the ocean where that subducting plate is kind of diving into the mantle. Um, and then between the trench and the volcanic arc is the fore arc. And then behind the volcanic arc is the back arc. All right. And then the example down here is when you have subducting ocean lithosphere uh, converging with uh, continental lithosphere. And then here, um, uh, the tendency of the of the melts, uh, the more of them become batholiths because the density of uh, the continental lithosphere is uh, so low. So uh, the odds are that these melts uh, most often uh, crystallize deep underground, but they they a lot do make it to the surface, um, and they become volcanoes, and that's the continental volcanic arc. But the same regions are here. There's a fore arc region, there's also a trench, and there's also uh, a back arc region. So deep ocean trenches, uh, like I mentioned before, they're created when you have that ocean lithosphere bending downwards into the mantle. Okay, um, The subduction angle, or the angle at which the uh, subducting ocean plate dives into the mantle is dependent on the density of the ocean crust, which is dependent on the age of the ocean crust. Old lithosphere is cold and dense. So you have very old ocean crust. That's going to be very dense and cold. Therefore, it's going to sink at a steeper angle. Okay. Um, if you're subducting young lithosphere or ocean crust that's very close to the mid-ocean ridge, um, it's warm. And when it's hot uh, ocean crust, it becomes very buoyant. And therefore, uh, when it does subduct at a convergent plate boundary or subduction zone, its subduction angle is diminished. Okay. Um, sometimes uh, uh, trenches won't even form if the subduction angle is too low. All right, the fore arc and back arc regions. Um, the fore arc is the region between the trench and the volcanic arc. The back arc is behind the volcanic uh, arc itself. Okay, um, both regions they consist of accumulated pyroclastic material, so volcanic in origin, eroded sediments that are exposed, and tensional forces actually prevail in these regions, and that causes stretching. Okay, even though this is a convergent plate boundary, and there's a lot of compressional force between the kind of downgoing plate and the overriding plate. There is what we refer to as back arc spreading. Okay, um, when the subducting plate is old and very cold and it flexes downwards, it'll sink almost vertically into the mantle. And what that does is that causes the overriding plate to kind of move forward quickly and thin out. And so behind the volcanic arc, you actually see um, some stretching. Okay, and uh, we call this this uh, the the actual trench will move as the subducting plate is kind of being pushed downwards at a high angle, and we call this rollback. Okay, so then the consequence of this is the overlying plate is stretched, and you can have a full-on back arc basin form, and that tension or pull apart stress causes thinning, and it can initiate seafloor spreading. So if you've got a picture here, so here we got subduction. Let's pretend this is. Um, uh, really old and dense ocean crust. And as it starts to subduct, it kind of uh, uh, moves in this direction. Okay, And as it moves in that direction, the trench moves in this direction. Okay, And as the trench rolls back, that causes thinning in this portion of the overriding plate. And so you can see over here, see how it thinned? And because it thinned, we have a stenospheric mantle uh, moving in to replace it. And you can actually have the formation of uh, a spreading center behind the volcanic arc. And so this would be the formation of a back arc basin. Okay, so subduction can lead to mountain building. And that's a specific type of mountain building. We call that island arc mountain building. And that results from uh, millions and millions of years of steady subduction of ocean lithosphere. So what happens here is it, you get continued growth 
uh, from uh, igneous and metamorphic rocks that are forming uh, within the arc. And it's really uh, just one step in the development of the Vanadites. Okay, so what happens, um, the Andes are a great example of the subduction type mountain building. We call it the Andean mountain, Andean type mountain building. So this is where we have long lasting magmatic activity because of steady subduction. And because you're generating all those melts that are traveling through the mantle wedge and into the overriding continental crust, um, a lot of them stagnate in that continental crust and crystallize as batholiths. And what that does is that thickens the overriding plate. Okay. So it starts off uh, with a passive continental margin, okay, and eventually the, the tectonic forces that move the plates change direction and a subduction zone forms. The ocean lithosphere is old and dense enough to begin sinking into the mantle. Okay, so here we go, a passive margin, and then over time uh, this subduction initiation will begin, and this will begin to subduct. A trench will form. Uh, another feature that we'll talk about in a second is an accretionary wedge will form uh, specifically in this type of subduction setting. We have melts, uh, water driven melting in the uh, mantle wedge is what we refer to this area, but it's a sthenospheric mantle that begins the melt forming primary basaltic magmas and they rise buoyantly uh, into the overriding continental lithosphere. Um, but they'll often stagnate and crystallize as batholiths or major magmatic chambers uh, within the overriding plate. Okay. Then over time, um, the forearc basin, which essentially forms as a result of like the sediment, uh, uh, a lot of eroded material from the arc itself uh, comes down and is, uh, the, a lot of the sediment and rock here can be sc essentially scraped off the surface of the subducting ocean plate and create this feature, just a, a really big mess of uh, material that's all like kind of smashed together, creating this accretionary wedge. And over time, it can be uh, pushed upwards because of the continued convergence. Okay, these two plates, there's a lot of pressure uh, of these two plates kind of pushing against each other and it uplifts this area. And you can have an exposed four arc basin, kind of like a central valley, and then behind that, you'll have um, batholiths exposed in mountains, all right? Um, so <clears throat> as the uh, ocean plate descends, water and volatiles are driven off the surface of the uh, ocean lithosphere into the overlying mantle wedge. That triggers partial melting of the um, mantle, which is uh, peridotite. So peridotites begin to partially melt. Um, those partial melts are mafic in composition, and we refer to them as primary magmas. And they're considered primary magmas because they're kind of like the very first uh, type of magmas to form, very mafic rich, and they're typically uh, basalt, okay? And because basalt uh, have uh, kind of higher density, right, they're made up of uh, a lot more uh, mafic min minerals rich in iron and magnesium, um, they tend to pool at the base of the continental crust. Okay, so they kind of stagnate at the base of the continental crust. And what occurs there is magmatic differentiation. So um, a lot of the first forming minerals start crystallizing and they start settling out of the magma, changing the magma's composition. And the magma as a result becomes less dense. And as it becomes less dense, then becomes more buoyant and starts to rise through the overlying continental crust. Okay, and that leads to the emplacement of these magmas in the continental crust, and they uh, most of the time eventually become batholiths, unless there's some like easier pathway uh, to the surface of the earth, like uh, perhaps uh, some faults that have formed and they can find a pathway to the surface. But most of those magmas crystallize deep underground, okay? Um, eventually, over time, uh, uplift and erosion exposes these deep batholiths, and uh, it's very, that's very apparent in the uh, Sierra Nevadas in California. If you go there, it's a playground of exposed granite, granodiorites that you can kind of walk all over, which is beautiful. Um, this is Torres del Paine, Chile, in southern Chile, really uh, 
an inaccessible area, um, but exceptionally beautiful. And what you see here, uh, this white area here, this is uh, a batholith, a granite batholith that is exposed at the Earth's surface. Uh, really beautiful. And then above it is a roof pendant of a, um, a metamorphosed host rock that was above the intrusion of this batholith. This crystallized deep underground and through uplift and erosion and now, uh, you know, sculpt sculpting via glaciers has left behind this, this absolutely stunning landscape. Okay, and then I, I mentioned the accretionary wedge was that area kind of um, in the forearc area. Uh, but essentially, it's accumulated sediments that scraped off the upper crust of the subducting plate. And the sub subducting plate just basically plasters that stuff on the edge of the continent. Okay, it's kind of it's very similar to uh, sediments being pushed onto a uh, the uh, blade of a bulldozer. Like the blade is just laying down on the ground, and then it and then the bulldozer kind of moves forward. Okay, um, if you have prolonged subduction, millions of years, you can thicken that accretionary wedge, um, and that it can protrude beyond sea level. Okay, um, and they become essentially coastal mountains. Okay. Um, and so the accretionary wedge acts as a barrier to the sediment that's moving from the volcanic arc to the trench, okay? Um, and then uh, you can have undeformed layers of sediment in the fore arc basin, okay? So that's, I think we have a picture coming up. Oh, the best example of this is in California, the Sierra Nevadas, because we have the coastal ranges, right? Uh, really close to the coastline, that's the accretionary wedge portion, then the Great Central Valley in California, and then that leads to the Sierra Nevada. So that's an, ex an excellent example of Andean type subduction zones. So here you can see here is the coastal ranges. This can be considered uh, like the accretionary wedge, okay, of a former um, area that was undergoing uh, long-lived subduction, okay. This is the Central Valley or the Four Arc Basin, okay, the Great Valley. And then behind that, this would be the uh, volcanic arc region, okay. Today, uh, through uplift and erosion, now it's an, a, a lot of exposed batholiths. Okay, so a lot of the, um, a different type of mountain building um, that has occurred in the uh, western margin of North America is referred to as Cordilleran type mountain building. And that's associated also with subduction, but subduction of um, ocean plateaus and microcontinents and island arcs. And when that when that happens, when there's subduction of uh, ocean plates that contain um, features on top of the ocean plates, those features don't subduct. Okay, so uh, for example, like an island arc or a microcontinent, um, those are too buoyant to subduct. So those small slivers of continental crust uh, essentially accrete or kind of paste themselves onto the uh, overriding continental plate. And we refer to those as terrains, uh, sometimes as like er exotic terrains. So it's, they're just crustal fragments of exotic material, meaning like it came from somewhere else, geologically speaking, came from uh, somewhere else and then uh, was carried via an ocean plate, that ocean plate subducted, and then it collided with the overriding plate and was added to the overriding plate. Okay, and that's what makes up a lot of the Pacific Northwest. Okay, so um, in the Pacific Northwest, a lot of the uh, terrains that have been accreted to the American continent used to be microcontinents. Microcontinents similar to like what you would think of as Madagascar. Okay, and then other terrains were island arcs. So think of Japan, Aleutian Islands, um, Japan, you know, those island arc type volcanic related islands sit on top of ocean crust and then imagine that subducting and then essentially the islands of Japan being added to mainland China or to the western United States. Okay, so here's an example. I know the images are pretty small, but bear with me here. So we have uh, continental crust here. We have subduction of ocean lithosphere here. Here's an approaching inactive island arc, okay? And as it approaches, um, it will not subduct because this material is, uh, it's not very dense, it's very buoyant, so it won't, it won't catch a ride with the subducting plate. It'll just kind of add on to the accretionary wedge of this uh, overriding plate, 
So if you can see this, it's a different color that would represent an exotic terrain that was added to this uh, continental crust here. Okay. Um, and then subduction continues, and then here's a microcontinent. And as subduction continues, the microcontinent will approach the larger uh, continental crust, and again, will be pasted or accreted on the continental crust as a brand new terrain. And this just happens continually. And um, a lot of geologists think this is how initially um, continental crust form was from this terrain accretion, nonstop terrain accretion, and then kind of, uh, you know, continental lithosphere kind of growing as a result of this. So here, look, check this out. This is the North American Cordillera. And all those different colors represent different terrains that have been kind of added to the American uh, continental crust. Okay, so the red areas are ocean terrains. Um, ocean plateaus can be terrains added to continental crust. Um, you can also have, uh, as we talked about, microcontinents and also island arcs. So each of these colors represents a different and exotic terrain, not endemic to the uh, American continental plate. So we refer to this as accretion and orogenesis. So not only are you accreting new terrains to the continent, but because it's a convergent plate boundary, you're also building mountains. There's a lot of compression and um, uh, rocks being pushed upwards because of the convergent plate boundary. So those large buoyant features on the ocean uh, lithosphere don't subduct, so they peel off the subducting plate and onto the continental crust, okay? And then subduction continues. So many of the terrains that make up the Northern Cordillera were scattered terrains on uh, former ocean plates in today's Pacific, okay? Um, and if we go back to the breakup of Pangaea, the Farallon Plate, which a small sliver still exists in the Pacific Northwest, and that's what's subducting there to create the continental arc volcanism we see in Oregon and Washington. Um, that essentially resulted from the piecemeal addition of crustal fragments. Okay, I think I have uh, an image later on showing the history of the Farallon Plate. Okay, let's move on to the next type of mountain building, and that's alpine type mountain building. These are uh, continental collisions. We're not dealing with ocean uh, crust and continental crust subduction, uh, you know, convergence. Now we're dealing with two continental plates uh, crashing into one another, okay? Um, where two continental lithospheres kind of collide, the, the surface in which they collide, we call that a suture or a suture zone, okay? Um, and that typically does or will contain little slivers of ocean lithosphere. Um, when this occurs, um, a lot of times, like continental crust will have a leading edge of an ocean plate ahead of it, and initially there will be subduction. Uh, but then the uh, continental crust will run out of that leading edge of ocean crust, and then some of that ocean, ocean crust can get pushed up onto the uh, overriding plate that it's approaching. Um, and those will form of ophiolite complexes or, or places where ocean crust is abducted onto the continent. Okay. So here, most of these compressional mountains exhibit crazy deformation, thick sequences of sedimentary rocks that create fold and thrust belts. Okay, so let's talk about the Himalayas. The Himalayas are the kind of perfect example of a really young mountain chain where this is currently occurring. So collision began approximately 50 million years ago. India collided with uh, Asia. Um, before that, as India was moving northward, it had a leading... Uh, ocean lithosphere ahead of it, and that was subducting and creating uh, continental arc volcanism in on the Eurasian plate. Okay, and the history of this is essentially when Pangaea uh, started to fragment, uh, uh, started beginning to fragment um, about 200 million years ago. India kind of moved northward and uh, rapidly, along with Australia, they're on the same plate, so they began moving northward, and eventually um, the ocean basin between India and Eurasia closed and India docked right into uh, Asia, okay? So there was a, a, a lot of uplift of the Tibetan Plateau. The Pen Tibetan Plateau area is part of uh, the Eurasian uh, tectonic plate. Um, 
so here it is. Here was India over, um, 20, uh, I think, 70 million years ago. As India moved northward, here's the closure of this ocean basin. Here's the leading edge of that subducting ocean lithosphere. Uh, but as it approached, you know, here's the continental volcanic arc in Asia as a result of this subduction. Um, but then you run out of subducting ocean lithosphere, and then now you have continental crust colliding with continental crust. Um, there's no subduction in this case. Um, the uh, continental crust the, of the in Indian Australian plate is too buoyant, so it, it kind of pushes underneath uh, the Eurasian plate, but pushes everything upward. So all of the um, uh, Eurasian uh, sedimentary rocks and are all kind of pushed upwards or thrust upwards. And here's the uh, ophiolite sequence that you see. And then here's that uh, suture zone right here. So a lot of the sedimentary rocks that formed on, on the ocean crust here are now kind of thrust upwards in the Himalayas. In fact, the top of um, uh, the top of Mount Everest, uh, those are limestones. Okay, so India is still moving northward. And so the crust, um, the, the, the continental lithosphere is shortening and thickening as those compressional forces continue to push these two plates against one another. Um, and this penetration of India into Asia has caused a lot of lateral displacement in Southeast Asia and in China. In those areas, they experience really strong earthquakes, and many transform faults have uh, formed as a result of that kind of lateral displacement. And we call that um, continental escape. Okay. So let's take a look at that. All right, here's just an, an image of the uh, some of the majestic peaks that the Himalayas, absolutely beautiful. But here, here we go. Here's India kind of moving northward, and it's slamming into Asia so strongly that it's for, uh, it's forcing a lot of the continental crust in these regions uh, to move out of the way, essentially. So in mainland Southeast Asia, you have a lot of transform faults that form here, and a lot of devastating earthquakes occur um, yearly in these regions because of this continental escape. All right, let's talk about the Appalachians, a much older mountain chain. Okay, um, the, They are of similar origin to the British Isles, the mountains there, Scandinavia, or the Caledonian Mountains, Northwest Africa, and Greenland. These are all related to one another. All right, And this mountain chain formed under three main steps, or what we refer to as orogenic events. Okay, And that kind of finished and culminated at the formation of Pangaea. So that was... Uh, you know, about 200 or 180 million years ago. The first of these steps was the Taconic Orogeny. So there was a volcanic arc located just east of North America or the North American plate at that time um, that was thrust uh, over the continental block. That was about 450 million years ago. So Volcanic rocks and marine sedimentary rocks were metamorphosed and, and are now exposed um, in New York. So here's the first step. All right, so the closing of the first ocean basin right here. Here's North America. This is the Taconic volcanic arc, and that um, this occurred about 600 million years ago. Okay, so um, <clears throat> the Taconic arc was uh, essentially accreted onto the North American continent. Right, and then that caused uh, some subduction of this ocean plate here. And so this was the first step of mountain building. All right. Then there was this uh, microcontinent called Avalonia, all right. and this was uh, just west of the uh, North American plate. But then that started moving towards uh, the area that was the Taconic Orogeny. All right. So around 450 million years ago, uh, this ocean basis, basin started to clo uh, close up. And then we had the collision of uh, the, the Acadian orogeny. Okay, so uh, a microcontinent collided with North America around 350 million years ago. We have many thrust faults. There was metamorphism, uh, right? Regional metamorphism. There were granite intrusions associated with this collisional event, and that substantially added another portion of continental crust to the North American plate. Okay, and then the last step of this mountain building process, the, uh, uh, excuse me, the Alleghenian orogeny. That's where um, Africa, the 
continental plate of Africa collided with North America. And that was about 250 to 300 million years ago. Okay, so material here was displaced 200 kilometers inland of North America. So that just uh, indicates how much compression this occurred. At the time, about you know 250 million years ago, um, the Appalachians resembled what the Himalayas the Himalayas would look like today. Okay, and then about 180 million years ago, that's when Pangaea began to break apart and rift apart. And the rift was actually east of the suture zone. And so the, what that means is that a remnant of Africa uh, remained welded to the North American plate. Let me show you a picture of this. So here's the Acadian orogeny. So in microcontinent, uh, exotic terrain essentially just added to uh, the Appalachian Mountains. And then here's the ancestral Atlantic, the Iapetus. And Africa collided with North America. And then this is the culmination of the Appalachian uh, mountains, much like the Himalayas. Okay, uh, here was that the the new suture zone, uh, and then when uh, Africa and North America rifted apart, a portion uh, of Africa remained with the North American plate. I got another image. Yep, right here. This is the remnant of Africa. And in fact, Florida is one of those remnants. If you um, drill deep enough in Florida and get beyond the 10 to 15,000 feet of limestone, you'll get to African metamorphic basement rocks. So we are actually a portion or remnant of the African crust. All right, so here's the developing North Atlantic. We're part of that coastal plain, the coastal plain states. And then here's the Piedmont region, the Blue Ridge Mountains, okay, uh, uh, very uh, narrow. Uh, exposed mountainous area, kind of uh, from North Georgia, kind of moving up towards uh, Virginia. Then behind that is the Valley and Ridge province and then the Appalachian Plateau. Okay. And so you can see this. If you look at satellite images of Western PA, I think this is the Susquehanna River uh, that cuts through uh, Pennsylvania. But you can see the, the Valley and Ridge province. You can clearly see uh, the ridges and valleys in between this area. A lot of plunging anticlines and synclines. Uh, visible here in a kind of a terrain satellite image. Okay, and these are all just different uh, geologic regions uh, within the uh, really old and eroded uh, Appalachian Mountains. All right, fault block mountains. Um, mountains can be generated on continental crust as we've talked about, through compressional forces. But you can also create mountains through rifting or tensional forces, OK? We call these fault block mountains, OK? And so what happens is um, if you have a fault and the hanging wall kind of goes down and the foot wall goes up like a normal fault as a result of tensional forces, these older rocks will kind of move up towards the surface as this block falls, and that creates that creates mountains. Those are the uh, these are the Grand Teton Range uh, of Wyoming, uh, the result of, uh, of tensional forces. Another great example of, of fault block mountains are the Basin and Range Province. Um, this is uh, one of the largest regions of fault block mountain creation. Okay, so they are found in between the Sierra Nevadas and the Rocky Mountains. Essentially, it's the entire state of Nevada. Okay. Um, it encompasses all of Nevada uh, and some uh, some of the surrounding states into New Mexico. Okay, so what's what's going on here is you have tilted and faulted structures called half half grabbins, um, and they produce these kind of uh, almost parallel mountain ranges. Okay, they call it basin range because it's almost a north south trending uh, ranges followed by a basin followed by a range basin range basin range. Uh, for nearly 3,000 kilometers, okay, um, and this type of extension began about 20 million years ago, and so it stretched the crust. Think of like uh, uh, caramel, and you and a friend are pulling it apart, and it's stretching and becoming thinner. That's what's happening to the crust in this region of Western North America, um, and because of that stretching, you start creating those normal faults. So we got an image here. Here we go. This is the entire Basin and Range province. So it includes a lot of Arizona, Southern California, and most of uh, Nevada. 
So this whole area is experiencing stretching. Okay, pulling apart creates those uh, uh, normal faults. Okay, um, and then you can you can actually see the terrain here, and you can see those ranges, those north south ranges and basins all over the state of Nevada. Essentially, it's it's like a stretch mark on the surface of the earth. It's Nevada's new state slogan, America's. Okay, so the, the two theories behind uh, why this occurred or uh, why the Basin Range province formed or why the stretching occurs is um, the Farallon Plate is uh, a sliver of an ocean plate that's still subducting under the Pacific Northwest. It used to be much bigger. Um, but what happened is that uh, the plate, the rate of subduction was faster than the rate of uh, um, uh, ocean plate production. So the uh, spreading centers also subducted with the Farallon Plate. Okay, so following the subduction of the Farallon Plate, specifically in areas like uh, just uh, west of the uh, Basin Range Province, um, that northwest movement uh, of the Pacific Plate, when it started to form a uh, transform fault, uh, that northwest movement has caused tes tensional forces that stretched the current pace and range region, okay? Um, another idea is that about 20 million years ago, um, the lithospheric mantle decoupled, meaning it detached from the crust above it. So, so the lithosphere is made up of crust and an, the upper portion of the mantle that behaves rigidly. So the idea here is the lithospheric mantle basically detached or delaminated uh, from the crust itself. And uh, what this caused was upwelling of hot mantle rocks. I don't know why I just <laughs> I blocked that, but hot mantle rocks, okay? And that produced the tensional forces in the crust. Okay, so here's the Farallon Plate. This is approximately 50 million years ago um, when there was active subduction in the west coast of North America. So here's where the Sierra Nevadas are being built by the kind of Andean subduction. Okay, so we have subduction of the Farallon Plate, Sierra Nevada is being created, mostly compression, here are the Rocky Mountains, okay? But over time, um, these spreading centers subducted and then this became a transform fault, okay? And so the idea here is, uh, um, here's one of the models, so uh, this became a transform fault, the Pacific Plate now started to move in this in a kind of northwestern direction and that caused stretching of the North American Plate. Um, and then here, uh, here's the, the subducting plate continuing to fall, and then here's that upwelling mantle, and those hot rocks are rising, which is causing the basin and range province to ex uh, uh, basically extend. Okay, so what causes the varied topography that we see on Earth? Well, we have to discuss the principle of iso iso isostasy to understand this. And essentially what that means um, is where you, when you have uh, the, the crust, the less dense crust, it kind of floats on top of the mantle. And isostasy is the concept of floating crust that's in gravitational balance. And so if you start adding weight to the crust, it's going to sink in uh, the uh, kind of uh, um, asthenospheric mantle. Okay, um, the book makes you try to envision uh, floating wooden blocks, but I prefer if you think of like container ships, imagine those container ships that are like docking into major ports in the US, they're filled with those 40 foot containers, right? And you have that boat and if it's fully loaded with containers, all that weight will make the boat like sink downwards into the water, right? And if you remove the cargo and you remove those 40 foot containers off the, the uh, cargo itself, that'll make the boat rise in the water because you're lifting the weight off the boat. Okay, we call that, we call those changes in elevation or, you know, the boat kind of sinking or rising in the water as isostatic adjustments. Okay, so the crust can subside or rebound, rise or fall with those adjustments or the removal of that weight. Okay, so one example of crustal rebound or essentially a boat rising is in Canada's Hudson Bay region. Um, there were major ice sheets there, huge ice sheets, like heavy kilometers thick ice sheets. 
uh, that sat on the crust. So that's like heavy cargo sitting on the crust. And because of all that weight, that pushed the crust downwards, right? But as, uh, we, as our Earth approached an interglacial time, and uh, the climate warmed, those ice sheets melted away. So the quote unquote cargo was removed from the crust. And today, because of all that weight being removed on the crust, the crust is rebounding and rising as a result of the removal of all that weight. Okay, so here's that uh, wooden block thing. You can think of wooden blocks floating in water the same way. I just like the container ship example. So how does this apply to mountains? Well, when mountains form, okay, you have a lot of compressional forces. And you're forcing a lot of these kind of uh, existing rocks to push against each other. And that thickens this area. So um, it thickens the mountain range, right? So uh, the rule of thumb is, like, you know how an iceberg... Here you have some water, and then you have an iceberg sitting out. And then uh, they say about like 80% of the iceberg is underwater. Okay, uh, the same holds true for uh, for mountains, but the ratio is like one to six. So if you have um, about one kilometer of rocks sticking up out of the surface of the Earth, you have about six kilometers of rock below it. Okay, and so by by kind of pushing two continental crusts against each other and thickening this area you change the mantle flow to move away uh, from this kind of uh, buildup of all these rocks. So there's all this added weight, and the lithosphere sinks into the mantle because of all the quote-unquote cargo that's being pushed into one region. But what happens over time is uh, rocks erode and uh, weather away. There's mass wasting, okay? Um, and so when erosion takes place, that's removing the cargo and all the sediment moves away from this area. So what happens is you start to get isostatic uplift, okay, um, slowly, but then the mantle convection or the mantle flow changes and starts to move back into the places where they used to be, and the lithosphere starts to move upwards, okay? And that's how um, really deep uh, metamorphic rocks can be exposed at the surface is through this isostatic uplift uh, which is true of the Appalachian Mountains today. A lot of the Appalachian Mountain uh, gneisses uh, that are exposed, in particular like the northern part of, of the Appalachians, like in Maine, those are really uh, deep metamorphic rocks that formed at a root of a mountain. But over, over the course of like 400 million years of erosion, that stuff's isostatically uplifting, and those deep crustal rocks are exposed at the surface because of that. And that's what happens to old mountains remnants of old mountains, uh, a lot of the material has eroded away and you're actually getting isostatic uplift. Okay, so how high is too high? Um, mountains can grow really high, but gravity can act uh, on the warm and, and weak rocks at the root of mountains, at the inside of the mountains. And eventually, the, the gravitational forces are so large that the rocks will kind of uh, plastically move and flow laterally. Okay, so this ductile type of spreading, uh, the consequences of this is subsidence, and we call this gravitational collapse. Okay, so if you have uh, mountains that are pushing up together and they're pushing rocks really high up into the uh, uh, higher elevations and also, you know, thickening uh, the continental crust and pushing rocks deeper. Uh, into the depths of, of um, uh, like where the asthenospheric mantle uh, was, eventually um, these rocks in the lower part of the root of the mountain will heat up enough and start to flow and start uh, the ductile spreading process. Okay, and that also causes uplift of these deeper rocks and subsidence of the mountains itself. We call that gravitational uh, collapse. And mantle convection plays a, a, a very important role in, in some of the varied topography we see on Earth. Um, huge super plumes or mantle plumes that kind of move through the mantle, these thermal anomalies of rock material moving upwards, um, can actually force or uplift huge continental areas. And that's true in, so in South Africa. In South Africa, um, they have uh, the elevation uh, is about 1.5 kilometers higher or uh, than would be normally expected in a stable craton. 
And what that means is there are rocks at the surface of South Africa um, that should be about a kilometer and a half deeper. So South Africa has uh, a lot of uh, mantle xenoliths and mantle rocks exposed at the surface. And that's why there's so many diamond mines in uh, South Africa because of this large scale vertical motion of mantle plumes pushing rocks up uh, on the surface, causing erosion of the, uh, um, the rocks above it and then exposing these really deep mantle rocks, which is really interesting. But we can also have crustal subsidence as a result of mantle convection. Um, this is, these are areas where there's down warping or the formation of basins. Um, so this can happen if you have an uh, ocean uh, slab that detaches from the trailing lithosphere. And as it descends, it kind of in its wake uh, creates like a downward flow uh, from the detached slab, causing uh, everything to sink behind it and pulling the crust into like a basin structure. And that's true of the uh, circular basins that's found on the, on the Michigan Peninsula um, and Illinois. We think that there was uh, like a subduct subducting portion of a, a ocean lithosphere kind of trailing down and pulling uh, mantle material behind it, causing this kind of down warping. So mantle convection does play a big role in Earth's varied topography.